Okay, let's look at historical archaeology. Uh, this is essentially archaeology that deals with history. What is history exactly? Well, as you uh, most of you know, history is the study of the past through written documents. So most of what we talked about so far has dealt with prehistoric archaeology. That is before writing uh, existed. Writing has only existed for about 5,000 years. Uh, in some areas of the world, writing, let's say, is more recent than that. Uh, so historical archaeology deals with time periods that you have written documents for. Now, some people would say, um, why do archaeology when you have the history books? Right? Well, most of you probably have realized is that uh, you know, history is sometimes inaccurate. Sometimes people lie. Uh, you know, people like to use that quote, history's written by the winners. So you're not necessarily going to get all points of view if you're only studying written documents. Also, who wrote these histories down? Usually they were people that were wealthier, uh, people that, uh, you know, usually um, men, Right? And so you're not going to get the full picture of a society or of historical events. Whereas, as we said before, archaeology doesn't lie. Archaeology is based on physical remains. And so you can get a picture of the past that you can't get with documents alone. And so this involves uh, many different aspects. One thing is cultural resource management. Uh, if, let's say, there's state-owned land, federal land that is being developed and there are remains, archaeological remains on there, it's uh, incumbent upon, let's say, the contractors who are building uh, whatever it's going to be to hire archaeologists to come in and do work in that area, excavate the remains, and report on them. This is known as cultural resource management and uh, there are private firms and there are also archaeologists that work for the state and, and federal government. Many of our students have gotten jobs in cultural resource management uh, positions. There's also, um, as we said before, this is a lot of this, you know, if you're working in North America, you might come across historic remains or prehistoric remains doing this cultural resource management. So what are some groups in the United States that have been kind of uh, excluded from the history in many respects, uh, or there's less on them uh, because they didn't have the opportunity to write down uh, the history. Well, uh, African American groups obviously are one. So not just talking about um, life on plantations uh, with African American slaves, but also you know freed slaves, middle class African Americans in different cities throughout American history. Uh, they're not written about in a lot of history books, and so archaeology can tell us about the life of the people, uh, you know, that how their culture changed and things like that. So one aspect that's been looked at is the uh, pottery that was made by uh, African-American enslaved people on plantations um, and how it's similar to West African pottery um, and, and sort of the notion of cultural uh, persistence and cultural continuity from West Africa to North America. Also looking at practices that you wouldn't necessarily find about in the history book. So on uh, one plantation, they excavated the remains of uh, an enslaved person's house and they found underneath the floor uh, crystals um, and other objects that were buried together, covered by a bowl. And it's pretty clear that what this was, was sort of a, a magic ritual to probably to um, ward off evil uh, that has West African um, traditions, right? So that goes back to West Africa. So we can see sort of everyday practices of enslaved peoples in North America, um, things that wouldn't necessarily make it into the history books. Also, um, you know, women have been kind of a ignored group at different times of history. 
uh, in terms of what their life was like, uh, what their role was in the society. And so archaeology is helping change uh, some of the notions that archaeologists had before about gender roles in the society. A recent find, you may have heard about this in South America, uh, a skeleton of a, of a woman found with hunting weapons um, now has sort of generated the idea that in some societies like this ancient society in South America, women were big game hunters. Uh, here you can see a woman using an atlatl or dart thrower uh, on the ancestor of the domesticated llama uh, and, and alpaca. It's called a guanaco. So this is the wild ancestor of the alpaca and the llama. So uh, women hunters in ancient times. And also class has been kind of ignored, right? So uh, what was the life like of, of poor people in the mid 1800s? You're not going to have as much information in the history books and in historical documents as you will the life of upper class people. So, for example, uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, I believe, is uh, excavating a poor farm cemetery. These are people who couldn't afford to have uh, their remains interned in the in the cemetery. They couldn't afford the the um, you know the headstone. They couldn't afford the space in the cemetery, and so they were buried in essentially a poor person's cemetery, unmarked grave, uh, and now archaeologists are excavating these remains and looking at the health and diet of these people so that we understand a little bit more of what their life was like uh, back through U.S. history. So uh, in, in many cases, archaeology uh, fits into larger political and cultural developments that we see in the United States. That is, uh, you know, focus and emphasis on race, gender, and, and class. Okay. Um, there's also uh, historical archaeology that focuses on um, events, famous events from history, and tries to learn about some of these events, trying to test whether the historical record was accurate or not. I'm going to talk about a couple of these events. Um, one of them I know pretty well because I got to visit this archaeological site, and it deals with an ancient battle between the Roman Empire in 9 AD and Germanic tribes here in Germany. Um, around the time of uh, Emperor Augustus, the Roman army was attempting to conquer Germania, as was called then, and Romanize it. And uh, at this point in 9 AD, they had fortresses along the Elbe River and the Rhine River, but uh, they really were not in control of this territory yet, as they were in other places like Gaul. Um, typically, in the, uh, and this actually, this battle that I'm describing is now the basis of a Netflix series. I think it's called The, the Barbarians or something like that, but it's a very new show. Uh, that is about specifically these events. So you can check it out if you're interested. Um, but uh, each in 9 AD, each season uh, around the time of the before winter, late fall, you know, mid fall, uh, the Roman army would go from the Elbe River to their fortresses along the Rhine River and sit out the winter on the Rhine. Um, now, um, what happened in 9 AD is that a um, German or Germanic tribesman who was in the Roman army was actually a double agent working against Rome. Uh, and he set up an ambush here in now what is called Kalkris in Germany. This is not too far from Cologne. Um, and he was an officer in the Roman army, um, the head of this Rome, of the three Roman legions that were marching back was a, a general by the name of Varus. Um, but uh, what Arminius, this um, Germanic soldier, planned is that he would, um, as they were marching back towards the Rhine River, he was going to get them to make a detour up north to put down a revolt, which was completely fake, 
uh, so that they would have to go through this Tudeburger forest where an ambush had been set up by him and they were going to attack the Roman legions. And what ended up was one of the worst disasters in Roman history. Three entire legions were completely destroyed. A legion is about 5,000 soldiers. So 15,000 Roman soldiers, except for a few stragglers, never heard from again. And as a result, uh, the Germans today do not speak a Romance language, unlike people in France that was conquered by Rome, right? So the, the, the German culture, ger German language never be became Romanized, uh, never became part of the Roman Empire because of this battle. The Germanic tribes under Arminius stopped the Roman army in its tracks. So uh, Arminius had this fake revolt. The Rome, Roman army went up to put down this revolt. It was, uh, you know, it was completely... Um, staged and they had to march in single file through these bogs and heavy forest it started to rain uh, and as they started to march up german tribesmen on either side of the pathway attacked the roman legions uh relentlessly and there wasn't anywhere for the roman legions to go they couldn't go back they could only go forward uh, and finally at this uh, hill where there was a, a bog on one side and a wooden fortification on the hill, um, they basically trapped the Roman army between two points. Uh, and again, they couldn't go up the wall, they couldn't go into the marsh, they could only try and go forward. Uh, and as they started to go forward, they were just continually attacked until essentially there were none left. It was at this point that the Roman general, Varus, probably uh, at this point, we know he uh, killed himself. It was probably in this position, uh, rather than be taken captive by the Germanic tribes, because he knew the Germanic tribes were likely to uh, torture and kill him. Uh, some of the Roman survivors were sacrificed to uh, Germanic gods in the bogs. Uh, we know this from Roman writers later. Uh, and again, as a result, the, uh, the Romans never conquered Germany or Germania. Uh, there was a statue that was erected um, by Germany in the 1800s to commemorate who they, what they considered the hero of this battle. But the Germans and uh, other historians didn't know exactly the location of the battle. This statue stands where they thought the battle occurred. Until about the 1980s when a British soldier who was stationed in Germany and was an avid archaeologist uh, took a metal detector and started looking in the area where he thought it made sense that the battle would have occurred. He started to find hordes of coins and also lead sling bullets. Now, the Roman coins did not date to later than 9 AD. The latest date was 9 AD, uh, which is when the battle occurred. Some of the coins also seem to be stamped V-A-R for Varus. So he uh, felt that he pinpointed the location of the battle um, and brought in archaeologists. Archaeologists came in uh, to where he had found those coins and other artifacts. And as they started to excavate, uh, they started to find remains of the Roman army, such as... Um, Human remains of Roman soldiers, you can see he got the top of his head chopped off. Um, they found a cavalry mask with the silver removed. Um, so probably a Germanic tribesman removed the silver and threw the mask against the wall, that wall that I showed you before where it was buried. They found uh, Roman uh, implements of war, weapons. They found pieces of helmets and stirrups. Uh, they also found uh, two donkeys, and the donkeys gave them uh, interesting information. One donkey, uh, as you can see here, had a bell. Inside the bell was wild wheat that was stuffed in the bell. Now, this tells us two things. One, the Romans, as they were marching, probably at, at one point wanted to be silent in the woods, or tried to silence the bell, and they grabbed some wild wheat and stuffed it in the bell. 
uh, from the wild wheat, we also can tell the time of the year that they were marching. And this wild wheat blooms in uh, you know, mid-fall. So, which is exactly when the history tells us the battle occurred. So, the archaeology corroborates a lot of the history. They also found a donkey with a broken neck. It seems like this donkey was trying to run up that rampart and fell back and broke its neck. Uh, so, this is a, a case where we only had the historical account at first. Archaeologists didn't know if the historical count was accurate or not. Luckily, archaeologists found the remains of the battle, and we could confirm many of the points in the history as to what exactly happened. Now, more and more in places like England, hordes from Anglo-Saxon times, Roman times, Celtic times, are uh, being found by amateur metal detectors. Now, uh, in some cases, and, and uh, the law allowed for these metal detectors to keep the hoard, and the hoard was then sold at different auctions. Now, fortunately, for something like the Salisbury hoard, which is a hoard from Celtic times, it became so dispersed among all of these different auction houses that it's really impossible for anyone to study. The objects from this hoard because they're scattered all over. Uh, more recently, an amateur metal detectorist found the largest Anglo-Saxon hoard that has ever been discovered with all sorts of beautiful objects. This is, dates to the time when the Anglo-Saxon kingdom, so it's about, um, I believe, uh, 700-800 AD, when the Anglo-Saxon uh, kingdoms yeah, were uh, Christian, and they were beginning to have to deal with the Viking army, the, the great heathen ar army, as they called it. Um, and so no one knows where this uh, horde came from, if it was a an Anglo-Saxon trying to hide this treasure, or a Viking who had stolen this and was hiding it in, in some horde. But it's remarkable because the the metal detectorist sold it to one museum um, for a good price. So it was bought by a museum. He specifically wanted to sell it to a museum so that it would be preserved and everyone within the United Kingdom could enjoy it when it was on display and scholars could study it. Um, it is a very important find. Um, pieces of swords, helmets, finely decorated, a gold cross was found that was crumpled up. Uh, you can see here this laid out would have been a cross. Um, so just a, a sheer amount of wealth. And it tells us that these Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were extremely wealthy, um, that, you know, that there was strong Christian um, presence within the culture at this point. But still, some of these pagan motifs being used in artwork, as they saw in the Sutton Hu burial. Now, all of this has to be, if you're going to do metal detecting in England, you have to register and you have to deal with the local historical society. Otherwise, you're just looting, which is what they uh, not too recently found um, with this Viking horde of coins being sold off. It led them to these metal detectors who uh, were basically uh, not consulting with local archaeologists, searching for, for treasure, and then trying to se uh, sell it. They were caught and um, got jail sentences as a result. Of, uh, uh, you know, without local historical societies being consulted, all of the information about these finds is uh, lost. Right? So... In the UK today, you have to do this with the permission of the people who own the land. You have to report the treasure. Um, if you're not going to sell it to the museum, uh, you know, it has to be assessed by a museum. They, it has to be offered for sale by the museum today. These are different laws than, that were enacted because of that earlier hoard I talked to you about. Uh, if a museum cannot purchase it, then it's sold at an auction.
right? And the landowner and the metal detector split the proceeds. The next uh, battle that we're going to look at, where archaeology played a role in sort of understanding what was going on, is the Battle of Little Bighorn, also called Custer's Last Stand. 